thank you. Uh, everyone having a good morning. I appreciate everyone walking by the puppies to get here. I'm not sure I would have done that, but <laughs> here we are. Uh, as Eve said, I'm Emily and this is Jamie. We're here from Major League Baseball and we'll be talking about caching strategy for high volume personalization content requests. So first, we're just going to give a brief introduction to our MLB data graph. Uh, we have a federated GraphQL service using the Apollo Gateway uh, and a number of different subgraphs uh, really defined around the data sources and the context um, that, of the data that they're returning. So as you might expect, we have a baseball subgraph that returns information on teams and players uh, and games. We have a content, which is media, video, editorial content, uh, config for layout and configurations, user profile, which means users and their favorite teams, players that they're following, teams that they're following, and various information about a user. And then the personalization, which is, at this point, mostly content recommendations based on those user preferences. Uh, and the primary use cases that we have uh, for our service are fan-facing web and mobile applications and some internal media operations that are running. So near the end of the season in 2022, uh, this is what sort of the state of the service. Um, we have a cloud, it's running on the cloud, and we're using, uh, we're relying on HPA, or horizontal pod auto scaling, in order to scale up the server during, uh, services during peak times. Most of our clients at this point were making post requests. So when we were using the response cache plugin to store the full response queries, uh, as well as data source caching based on the TTL of the data sources that we were pulling in data. And we had a mix of Redis and in-memory caching. This was all working pretty well, and whoops. <laughs> you can see at peak times we were doing about a million requests per hour. But there were a lot of changes headed uh, for opening day in 2023. One of the main ones is that our terrific uh, mobile development team was working on a new home surface uh, for the app that was based on users, their favorite teams, and was going to be incorporating a whole bunch of new views and new queries. And this meant we were going to see millions of more users because this is, it's a very popular application uh, for MLB games. We also had support for additional homepage modules on our website, and we also had clients switching to use GET requests and Automatic Persisted Queries, or APQ. Just going to take a step back and just talk a little bit about the MLB traffic pattern that we see. So somewhat predictably, we see more requests during the season and during individual days, we see more requests when there are live games. So, and that, from a high level, it's a pretty predictable pattern. However, if you look at individual days, there tends to be a lot of variation depending on how many games are going on, how many games are going on simultaneously. There might be up to 15. Uh, and it gets a little less predictable. In addition, we also see a lot of users impacted by in-game events uh, and the push notifications that go out to indicate to fans that something big just happened. Uh, in this particular notification, if you can see it, there was, uh, during the WBC, there was a big moment where in the USA-Venezuela game, Trey Turner hit a three-home run, uh, three-run home run, giving the U.S. team the lead. This was a huge moment in the WBC. There was a big push notification, and millions of fans went to the app to see what was going on. Unfortunately, all these simultaneous launches cause a little bit of a thundering herd. And you can see our requests increased faster than our HPA could really scale up to deal with it. And not to get too technical, but that is not something that you want to see your service doing. We actually saw the service crash for a minute. It recovered very quickly, but still, this was a real yikes moment for us. Uh, so after we saw this spike in outage, uh, it became very apparent that we needed to increase our level of caching uh, at every possible layer. Um, so I'm going to go through a quick overview of kind of how we did that at each level, uh, and then we'll take you through a few more examples from our MLB app of what that looked like in practice, and then. We'll go through a couple of the pitfalls, uh, mistakes we made, and just random things we ran into. Uh, kind of fun. So yeah, obviously the first place we wanted to look was leveraging our CDN uh, for caching. Um, but we need to be very deliberate about how we do this. Uh, for one, it's probably not going to do much for us unless our clients are actually using GET requests. Uh, so we have to work with our clients to ensure that. Further, uh, if they're going to be using GET requests, it's best if they're using APQs uh, 
just so we can avoid running into any issues around the query length. Um, and I assume many of you are familiar with APQs already, but we'll go into a little bit more about what those look like uh, on a, one of the next slides. Also, if we're gonna use the CDN cache, uh, we need to be kind of considered about the TTLs for what we're actually caching. Um, MLB has all kinds of data from like live statistics to things that change quite rarely. Uh, so we need to look at what cache control headers our gateway is actually returning to the CDN and then past that, what headers the CDN is gonna send to the client because that's yet another layer of caching we need to watch out for. Uh, further, uh, as we mentioned, we have personalized data at MLB. Um, we have users identified in a bunch of different ways uh, like session ID cookies, uh, authorization headers, we need to be very careful that a user doesn't get another user's uh, recommended data. Um, when we first turned on our CDN a couple years ago without just doing any configuration, we ran into an issue like that. Uh, it's just the kind of thing that you don't want to happen twice. <laughs> so yeah, aside from the CDN uh, and the client, there's three other layers of caching within our server itself. Um, if you don't configure it at all, I, I think we use Apollo server, most of that's gonna happen in memory, uh, but we choose to use a shared cache uh, for everything, all of the instances of our servers, um, that's mostly Redis. I won't go into too many technical details, but it's a bit in memory, but mostly Redis. Uh, so the, the three kinds that we're doing are the APQs, full response caching, and data source caching. Uh, so a couple examples of what each of those things look like. Uh, the APQ, you'll note, the cache key, this is, these are pulled from within our Redis cache, uh, is prefixed with APQ and then has a hash. And you'll notice the value itself is not the result of the query, uh, but just the query. Um, this just helps us send less data over the wire uh, in general. And, you know, I won't go into how the client actually does it, but basically the client makes, you have to have your client configured to say, I want to do APQs. If you're using Apollo client, you have to also say use get requests for APQs uh, to get this all set up. We also use the response cache plugin. Uh, again, we use Apollo server, but no matter what GraphQL server you're using, you can use the concept of response cache. Uh, so you see the key here is prefixed with FQC and the value itself is the actual result of the query. Uh, in this case, the example query is like a get players uh, with a given player ID and the response is all the information we have about Shohei Otani. So, you can see we have a last name field with his last name, uh, and then a little bit of information about the TTL that's been calculated for that response. Uh, so in this case, it's a max age of 60. Finally, uh, I have an example of like data source caching. So again, we have like a bunch of internal APIs that our GraphQL service sits on top of. Um, you'll see keys are prefixed with HTTP cache, and then let's say we wanted to ask our statistics API or something for information about the Padres, uh, the result of that's gonna be stored in that same shared Redis cache uh, for a TTL that's calculated based on the headers that we get from that internal API. Uh, and you can see the result here is just the San Diego Padres team ID and their name. And I should note that those two things are, you know, these are examples of data that's going to change very rarely. Um, so it's safe to say we could cache the San Diego Padres team name for a very long time if we had everything configured correctly. So yeah, so now that Jamie's given a little bit of an overview, let's see how we did looking at specific views on the home view. So first, if you open the app and you have a favorite team set, you get this team snapshot view, which consists of schedule and game, uh, game data for your favorite team. In this view, the game schedule is relatively static, but we wanna be able to get live game data pretty quickly. Yeah, so the way we can configure all of that, um, like you saw on the last slide, we had a, a TTL equals 20 next to where the actual line score would appear during a live game. So we can use the cache control directive to annotate our schema at whatever level of detail we want uh, to kind of configure things appropriately for those kinds of situations. Um, the directive can take arguments for the desired max age, uh, the scope for the type or field, uh, whether or not it's, public or is in like the same for every user or private is in like the response needs to be specific to the user who asked for it as well as an inherit max age argument. Uh, we can also set like a default value for the entire subgraph or gateway if you don't want to go through the trouble of annotating every single type in the entire schema. Uh, but so the way this directive works uh, in the Apollo context is it's going to calculate the most restrictive time it sees among all these annotations. Um, so 
if any field is private or the max age is set to zero, that's gonna be the TTL for the entire response. So we need to be very careful. Um, let's say we were like asking for some user data along with all of our you know, generic what's going on in this live baseball game. Uh, we wouldn't want that query to be private and then you know, subsequently not cached at all. Uh, I should mention you can also dynamically set caches in your resolvers. We don't really do that at all um, just because it's a little bit clearer to only have that in one place. But that's totally an option and the results is the same. Uh, so I have one example here uh, for the line score type, which is like the line score for a live game, uh, annotated with a max age of 20 seconds and scope to public. And the resulting header we would get from our baseball data subgraph would just be this cache control public max age 20. Um, of course, there's another, another level where the gateway has to interpret that. But uh, let's say you weren't running a federated model. This could be what your CDN or your client would receive if you weren't using a CDN. In this next view, this my news, we actually do see user specific data. So in this case, we're mixing a uh, general MLB headline stack with the most recent information with preferences that a user is being recommended. In this case, our user is a Padres fan. So they're seeing Padres uh, news as well as general league, uh, general league news. Um, it might be news about their favorite players or uh, et cetera. So in this case, we do need to be aware of the user header. So as Jamie was saying, cash, uh, using the CDN cache can be an issue. Uh, yeah, so I should say it's definitely not impossible to cache this data at the CDN level. Um, you could use edge functions or some other feature that whatever CDN you're using has. Uh, but we currently don't do that at all. <laughs> However, that doesn't mean we can't cache it in our shared Redis cache using the response cache plugin. Um, so we have everything around user, like we have our user type here, scope to private, uh, but we do have a max age of 60 seconds. So that's gonna apply to our shared Redis cache. And also we're making sure our CDN is still, even though it's not using it, it's forwarding that header to our web and mobile clients. So they can say, okay, we should keep this around for 60 seconds. Um, we've also taken care to kind of work with our clients to make sure that this data, again, is not, part of the same query as that generic baseball data. Um, so let's say like you load up the app, the request, the, the query that the app is making to say like, what's this user's favorite team? What's their profile data? That's all siloed from the later requests uh, for let's say the baseball schedule or the live game score. So if you wanna use the response cache plugin um, for this kind of stuff, you have to use the session ID uh, hook which is just some kind of unique identifier that associates a user with a response. Uh, in our case, we use something from our CDN that's like a load balancer uh, session identifier, but it could be anything, you know, a user ID, uh, some sort of cookie or, or whatever. Uh, and it's very flexible what you wanna use. It just matters that it's unique for each user. Uh, and again, you can see we have the hit rate here. It's still quite low, but it, it's saving our server uh, some work. The reason it's low is that, let's say a user doesn't get their favorite headlines and then immediately refresh the app for new headlines and the TTL is only a few minutes for this query. Um, but again, it, it still does something. So great, those are two examples where, you know, we put in the directives, everything was going well. Now we're gonna look at a couple of views where we saw some maybe stranger behavior that we needed to take a closer look at. Uh, in this case, we have our my follows view where a user sees players that they follow and information about them, the latest news stories, uh, their latest performance data, and different information about them. As this feature was rolled out, we noticed that we started seeing out of memory errors uh, in our baseball subgraph. And we started to be concerned that maybe we had introduced a memory leak on the service. Uh, yeah, so what was going on? Way too much in-memory caching. Um, if you imagine a baseball player has like uh, the team they're on, um, sometimes every team they've ever been on, and because this is like GraphQL, we want to support any field that the, our client might want to request for a given query. Um, so they have stats for every game that's happened all year, um, you know, down to like even like, you can ask for a very granular level of data for a given baseball player. Um, so when we added this query, we were basically, we're using too old of a version of Apollo server where the cache, the in-memory cache is unbounded by default. Um, after 3.8.1, uh, 
uh, there's, I think, a 300 megabyte limit on it. But basically, the solution for us was just updating our server version uh, and then also offloading more of our caching to Redis in general. Uh, so yeah, again, as I mentioned earlier, we moved to more of a mostly Redis architecture for this. And then in this view, this one was really interesting. So we have the stories view where there's a carousel of stories that a user will see where one of the stories is about their favorite team and, uh, and, the, and the game that they just recently played. And then a carousel of additional popular stories at that particular time. So there really aren't that many games on a particular day, max of 15. And then we have uh, a carousel that's the same across all users. So this is very cacheable data. But for some reason, we were seeing millions of queries <laughs> for this data every day. Uh, and we were seeing, uh, if you look at that, we're also seeing very limited uh, internal cache. So what was going on here? Uh, right, so this again illustrates why we have to pay very close attention to what's going on with all of our operations and what's being cached. Um, this operation contained two separate queries uh, that both leveraged the include directive. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the include directive, it just basically configures whether or not a given piece of the operation is actually included. So our gateway, um, one query gateway was hitting the baseball subgraph exclusively, the get, get, get game stories by date query. And get selection entirely uh, hits exclusively the CMS content subgraph. So when one of these was false, um, let's say we weren't doing that one to hit the baseball subgraph, we would get from back from the subgraph, like it was still sending a query, uh, but an empty query, not even like the type name or anything. Um, in this instance, the subgraph was not sending back a max age header at all. Uh, and so the gateway is saying, okay, like I mentioned earlier, what's the most restrictive thing we've seen? Well, probably this missing header. Um, so say, okay, max age is gonna be zero. Luckily, we were able to work with Lucas from Apollo and realize that we could get around this by just updating our gateway version. Um, so after 2.3.4, uh, the gateway won't make a request to that subgraph at all. So that was nice, a pretty easy fix, but again, it illustrates how close we have to pay attention at, at every possible level of this. And it's like, let's say like maybe a subgraph goes down entirely and starts returning 500 errors or something. You know, do we know what's going to happen in that case when the gateway tries to calculate the TTL for this operation? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you can see after we updated, the amount of requests to origin went way down. Uh, and it's too small to see, but it's vast majority cache hits for this operation. And lastly, we have the standings module, which again, this is shared across all users. All users are basically seeing the same standings <laughs> response. Uh, in this case, we would occasionally see the data vanish for extended periods of time. It happened rarely, but enough so that it had a pretty big impact. And this was despite the fact that our REST API looked fine. We weren't seeing any errors from our downstream baseball uh, data graph or data service. So this, took an, this was another one where it took a real closer look in order to see what was going on. Yeah, uh, so the, the actual caching the data source is doing, it's easy to miss if you're not paying close attention. Um, the way it works in Apollo out of the box is it's just going to look at the cache control header that's being returned by the underlying service. Uh, in this case, when the underlying service was returning a 404, its CDN would say uh, max age is four hours. The Apollo data source doesn't know any better. It's like, okay, well, then I'll cache this response for four hours, um, even though it's a 404. Luckily, we were able to use like a, a hook in the data source. I think it's called cache options for or something. Um, you can set a TTL override for the entire data source, or you can do things dynamically. Uh, so we were able to say, okay, if we get a 404 response from this underlying API, uh, set a TTL of 45 seconds. And the reason we're caching it at all is just so we don't, I don't know, overload the underlying service if something's wrong with it. So yeah, we're gonna go through a couple takeaways. Um, basically, caching GraphQL is very complicated and you have to pay close attention. Um, from the clients, to the gateway, to your subgraphs, to the data sources, to the underlying APIs, there's like a million places where things can go wrong. Uh, and also, things can stack on top of each other. Um, you might have a TTL set for 30 seconds at all those layers, but then 
when a pitch happens in the baseball game, it's not updating for, I don't know, two and a half minutes, and you don't know why, because things are stacking on top of each other. Um, it's also an iterative process. We need to monitor for unexpected behavior. Uh, so ideally, you have some level of observability at all these layers, but it's easier said than done. Um, we've had to go into our Redis cache many times uh, and do a bunch of investigating, searching for keys, deleting keys manually uh, to get where we are now. And then finally, uh, you know, we're lucky enough to be in a position where we can work with our clients to optimize their operations. Um, so we can negotiate reasonable TTLs for everything. Uh, you know, they would love it if everything updated every five seconds, something happens in a baseball game, but our services can't necessarily handle that, at least not for every kind of data. Um, also, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, there's separation of private content, so we can minimize those private queries, and then the cacheable public stuff happens separately, uh, if that works for your clients. And of course, there's a trade-off. Um, that means more queries in total, but we found for us that that trade-off was, it was better to do that than not. Uh, and then, yes, we also created with all of our clients to use GET requests and APQs whenever possible. Um, so, yeah, just the benefit of working closely with both our mobile and app teams uh, to get to the point where we can handle the traffic we do now. So we're not going to read through this uh, entire slide, but this is uh, just an overview of our current graph setup uh, and, and the caching that we have. So you can see the CDN edge servers uh, going into the gateway uh, and how we have the different uh, plugins working. Uh, and we've used, and again, as Jamie uh, mentioned, we're using Redis, and then we also have the in-memory cache. And then we also have you know, the, the caching around our individual data sources. So we're working on some additional changes, but this is pretty much the state of things as they are right now. And you can see from here, uh, this is kind of our happy ending. <laughs> you know, we saw, we did see a great increase in, in the number of requests that we were dealing with. So starting uh, even in spring training, we were seeing peaks of about 5 million requests an hour. And then leading into opening day, where you can see right around March 30th, we were seeing around 15 million per hour. So it was very good that we made these changes. We, we really needed to beef up our caching in order to support this type of load. I think currently we're seeing something like with 35 million a day, a request a day. So a ton. our previous configuration was not gonna be able to support that kind of load. And I don't have the exact number, but the vast majority of those are cache hits now. I'll right. say at least 80%. Yeah, which I'm is great. Comfortable yeah. saying. <laughs> <laughs> Um, great, so that's, uh, that's where we are now. Uh, we have this, I'll put up this link so you can share your, uh, any feedback that you have for this presentation. I think we're hitting a little uh, under time. Um, and then we'll be sitting at a topic table uh, at 1245 if anyone has any questions about caching, uh, baseball, the postseason. Uh, but thank you very much for, for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.